Hello everyone. I'm very happy to be hosting today's webinar, which is on the topic of welfare benefits. I'm delighted to be joined by our, by our expert speaker, Mr. Richard Conway. Richard, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Zabir. Thanks for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure to be having you on today, Richard. Thank you for your time and efforts, and we're really looking forward to the session ahead. That's my pleasure. Let's have a look and see who's joined us so far today. So I can see we have 11 participants and it's growing 13 15 let's have a look at who's joining us so we have brenda brenda's joining us today estelle claire liz sonia hello everyone thank you all for joining us it's great to have you all on let's wait a few minutes to try and get as many of our attendees on so they don't miss out on anything Whilst everyone is waiting, a little bit of background information about Richard is that Richard works for the Disability Law Service, the DLS, based in Vauxhall, Central London. Richard deals with the Welfare Benefits Helpline and advises those with long-term illnesses. So we're in great hands today. Hopefully. <laughs> the format, no doubt. The format for today's session is that it will be broken down into two parts. Uh, the first part will be a presentation by Richard, and the second part will be a Q&A opportunity where we'll be taking uh, in your questions uh, and putting those to Richard. We'll do our best to answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, and uh, if you find that you are benefit benefiting from our webinars and would like to support more of these and other similar SRUK initiatives, you can do so now by texting SRUK webinar to 70450, which will donate five pounds uh, and will go a long way to helping us with these initiatives. All texts cost five pounds plus your standard rate message. So once again, that's SRUK webinar. Uh, it's not case sensitive, so it can be upper or lower case to 70450. Uh, so, so far we have 16 participants um i think we'll have a few more that will be joining us but otherwise um, i'm happy to hand over to yourself richard and you can start sharing your screen and you can begin so thank you richard thank you zabir thank you okay guys i'm just going to quickly share my screen so that everybody will be able to see the powerpoint that we're going to be looking through so again today we're going to be looking at uk welfare benefits changes and effects on people living with scleroderma and Reynolds um, phenomenon. And um, my name's Richard Conway, as uh, Sabir said, I'm a welfare benefits advisor at the Disability Law Service. So uh, the Disability Law Service is just a small charity based in Vauxhall, and we provide um, advice and help to carers and disabled people um, on legal advice around housing, employment, community care, and of course, welfare benefits. We also campaign on issues affecting carers and disabled people. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about us, please follow us on our website at www.dls.org.uk. You can find more information about us and we also have some helpful fact sheets on various different issues to do with disabilities and uh, welfare benefits. So uh, the key topics that we're going to be discussing today are the definition of disability in the UK. We will also look at what welfare benefits are available to you to claim. And we'll be looking at the relevant changes to welfare benefits due to the COVID crisis. Part two, we'll have a Q&A session where I will be answering your questions on welfare benefits. So let's go into part one. So part one is going to be looking at what constitutes disability. And in order for us to do that, we're going to have to look at the definition of, a, of disability under the Equality Act 2010. And then once you know what the definition of disability is, and if that fits you particularly, you can look at which benefits are crucial for you to be claiming. And then we'll also look at the COVID restrictions, easements and updates to welfare benefits. 
So quickly moving on to the definition of dis disability. So the definition of disability can be found in the Equality Act 2010, section six. So section six, subsection one A and B, they defines disability as the following. It's a person who has a disability for the purpose of the act, if they have a physical or mental impairment and this impairment substantially and long-term has a substantial and long-term adverse effects on your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. So it's quite simple. If you have an impairment that substantially uh, affects you being able to do these day-to-day -day activities, you could potentially come under section six of the Equality Act. So what you'll be able to see here as well, and which is important for you guys to understand, is that it's not just about disability, it's about illness too. So if you have a long-term illness that causes an impairment and that affects your day-to-day -day ability to be able to do activities, this will also cover you too. So we're talking about people who have recently become ill or if you've had an accident or if you've developed a medical condition such as scleroderma and Raynaud's, this will also include you too. Because all you need to do is to know that you, your condition that you are contending with is substantially long-term adverse effect upon your ability to be able to carry out a day-to-day -day activity. And so if that's you, then you are a protected characteristic. And that means that your protected characteristic cannot be directly or indirectly discriminated against because of your disability. So it's really important for you to know that if you come under the Act, you are a protected characteristic and you should not be directly or indirectly discriminated because of that particular um, diff difficulty that you have. So also under section 20 of the Equality Act, any person with a disability or a long-term illness can ask for reasonable adjustments. And these reasonable adjustments can be asked for in the workplace from employers. And you can also ask them from the DWP and the DWP's employers. So reasonable adjustments must be put in place to avoid substantial disadvantage to you. So because of your impairment or your disability or your long-term illness, if you are trying to access employment, if you are trying to get to and from work, if you are having to access an assessment with the DWP, you can ask for reasonable adjustments to help you not be substantially disadvantaged in being able to access those particular activities. And so now that you know that you are protected, what benefits could be crucial for you to be uh, applying for? So there are two types of benefits in the UK. There is a income-related means-tested benefits and there are non-means-tested disability benefits. And it's really important for you to separate the two, okay? Because sometimes people can look at these and think that they're the same, they're not. They're, it's, it's, it's very important that if you're getting one of these benefits or both of one of these benefits, then you should separate the two. So for income-related means-tested benefit, the main benefit today is universal credit. And I'm sure many of you will know what that benefit is and you'll be on that benefit. But also, if you are not on any benefits at the moment and you are uh, having difficulty with getting to work because of an illness, then you can apply for new style benefits. These benefits are based on your previous national insurance contributions. So you can get new style job seekers allowance or you can get new style employment and support allowance. And apart from that, for disability benefits, but depending on your age, so anybody between the age of 18 and state pension age can apply for a personal independence payment, which some people call PIP. And there's also disability living allowance for children because adults can no longer apply for disability living allowance. Attendance allowance is for people who have reached state pension age and carers allowance. So that sometimes people get carers allowance mixed up with means tested benefits. Carers allowance is based upon your earnings, not your capital or your savings. 
So that's why it's not a non, it's a non means tested benefit. They do, it is based upon your earnings. So you can only earn 128 pounds a week. And if you're caring for somebody who gets one of the above benefits like PIP, disability living allowance or attendance allowance, if you're caring for them regularly and substantially for 35 hours a week, you could potentially uh, apply for carers allowance for doing that. So let's have a quick look at the relevant changes to these, some of these benefits. Haven't been able to, we won't have the time today to talk about all of the relevant changes, but here are some of the most important things to look out for. So um, the reintroduction of face-to-face -face and video assessments for disability benefits and work capability benefits. These are being reintroduced now because of the COVID crisis these, uh, the easements are being uh, lifted and restrictions are being lifted. So it's really important for you, if you're coming up against an assessment, if that's going to be you, if you're, you're looking forward to an assessment or um, that's going to be you in the future, remember to ask for reasonable adjustments, okay? You can ask for these reasonable adjustments. You can have them put in place by the assessment providers such as Atos, Capita and Maximus. They actually have a public duty to put in place reasonable adjustments if you ask for them. So we do hear from the DWP that they are working with their assessment providers to make sure that assessments face to face are safe and they've put in COVID restrictions. But if you don't feel safe with that and you would prefer to have a home visit or you would prefer to have a video assessment or a telephone assessment, then ask for it it's really important for you to be confident enough to ask for that to happen if you're not feeling safe having to travel and go to a particular location. And this, is, this one's quite important as well. So in 2019, um, it was put together that, there were, that the DWP were going to look at doing a single digital platform, which means that the work capability assessment and the disability benefit assessments were going to be brought together under one assessment. Now, because of the coronavirus, this was put on the back burner, but it's starting to go ahead now. And they're doing this in transformation areas in East London. So they're doing it in postcodes in East London to test this out. And what the DWP are doing with these, this, this platform is they are seeking this pilot, they are seeking to find better ways of carrying out face-to-face -face assessments they want it to be more effective for people not to have to undergo several different um, assessments and then um, make that more easier for them. They're also trying to find better ways for you to be able to provide evidence and not have to provide it twice and then look at a whole range of support of ways of, to make it available for people to be able to access assessments. Now, we don't know how uh, good this is going to be or how beneficial it's going to be. There's been a lot of um, criticism about having a single digital platform, but we'll have to wait and see. It's important for you guys to know about that. If you are having your access in a work capability assessment or PIP uh, for a disability assessment, if you're in these particular places right now, this is what the future is probably going to look like. And also um, appeals to Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Services are starting to resume face-to-face -face, and in some cases via video link. And they're also still doing them via telephone as well. So be prepared for this. If you have an appeal that's lodged, you might have to go and do face-to-face -face assessments, face-to-face uh, -face, um, tribunals, okay? So ask for reasonable adjustments. If you feel it's not safe for you to travel and you would like to have the, assess the um, appeal done over the telephone or via video link, be brave be uh, confident enough to ask for that to happen, okay? You can ask for um, assessments to be done in a different way. Now, it will be up to the court to decide, the tribunal to decide. They will have the final say, but at least you know that you can ask, okay? And um, further Nightingale courts are being set up to deal with the backlog of appeals that people are waiting to be heard. So if you're waiting for an appeal to be heard and you've been waiting quite some time, there's some encouragement that uh, further Nightingale courts have been set up. These Nightingale courts are these makeshift courts that have been set up in function rooms so that they can go ahead with more and more backlogs of appeals that have been waiting due to the coronavirus. 
So um, in universal credit, some of you guys might know about the 20 pound uplift. So this is set to be removed in September the 30th. So from the 1st of October, 2021, this is set to be removed, okay? What that means is, is if you are on universal credit, you're a claimant, you could find yourself around 87 pounds per month worse off. Now we're hoping that the government will extend this or put it in permanently, but you should be aware that this is something you should be thinking about, that your standard allowances under universal credit could be around 87 pounds worse off in, on the 1st of October this year. So the coronavirus job retention scheme and the self-employed income support scheme for people who are self-employed, they've both been extended until the 30th of September. And the minimum income floor for self-employed claimants under universal credit is going to be reintroduced in August 2021. What that means is, is that the universe, if you are self-employed and you are on universal credit, universal credit would assume that you have a minimum income of around uh, 200, I think it's 260 pounds a month. Whether you're earning that or not, they will assume that is what you're earning. So it's the minimum wage, which is eight pounds something um, an hour times 30 hours. So they will assume that's what you're earning anyway, whether you're earning that or not, and they will reduce your universal credit accordingly. And finally, um, this is a really good piece of news for people living in Scotland. Scotland is, has started from February. They've introduced the Scottish Child Payment. What that is, is a payment of £10 a week for each child under the age of six. And that there's no limit to how many children that, that can be. To be eligible for that, you, you have to be in households, need to be in receipt of one of these following benefits. So universal credit, income-related job seekers allowance, not new style, okay? Income related to ESA, not new style. Housing benefit, income support, pension credit, and any tax credit. So if you're in receipt of tax credits, you can get this payment for your children. So part two now, we're gonna move into the Q&A and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that everybody can see me and we can begin to ask questions. Thank you, Sabir. Thank you very much, Richard, for the very insightful presentation. Thank you. Uh, we've no doubt hugely benefited, and there's a, a lot of positive feedback in the comments section. Thank you. Cool. Let's have a look. And we've also had some questions come in. Um, I'd also now like to take this opportunity to guide you all uh, into sending uh, your questions over to us by hovering over the Zoom application. There's an area that says Q&A. If you click over that section, you'll be able to send in your question to us and I can then put your questions uh, to Richard. We'll do our best to answer as many of the questions as possible. Um, also, uh, a reminder, if you would like to donate, you can do so by texting SRUK webinar to 70450 and text costs £5 plus one standard rate message and that's the text £5 uh, to donate five pounds to SRUK if you if you are benefiting from these webinars and would like to support future webinars and other similar initiatives that SRUK run. Um, I can currently see we've had a few questions come in. We've had one from uh, Melanie, and Melanie uh, says, if we are counted as registered disabled due to scleroderma, do we qualify for VAT relief? For instance, if purchasing a scooter. Uh, thanks for your question, Melanie. Um, quite simply, I don't know. I do not know the answer to that question. Um, that's a VAT question. What I can do though, is I can find out the answer to that and I can uh, get that answer to you. So what I would suggest is, is that if you would like to email me this question at benefits at dls.org.uk, and I'll also put this in the chat box so that you can see this as well. Um, if you give me that email, uh, that, that send that over to me, I will research that for you and I will find out the answer to that question. Thank you very much, Richard. Was that benefits at dls.org.uk? That's right, yeah. Fantastic, I've just added that into the chat for anybody. Thank you, Zabir, thank you. I would like to send in their questions direct to Richard. 
Uh, we've had a few other questions come in. Uh, there's one that says, uh, if I'm on standard rate PIP and my symptoms are deteriorating, mm. one point off enhanced rate, is it worth the risk of contacting DWP to try to get more? My partner also gets carer's allowance to look after me and we are both apprehensive and stressed about rocking the boat despite my deterioration. So a bit of a complex question that's come in. No, um, I would always encourage you to do that, but I, I have to be responsible and say to you, whenever you're challenging a DWP decision, whether it be an appeal or whether it be a change of circumstances review, there's always, unfortunately, an opportunity and a chance that the DWP can enhance, reduce and take away your benefit. Now, is that likely to happen? Probably not, because if you have a wealth of evidence and you make a strong application, you will be able to um, eventually get that benefit that you deserve. And that's what we see happening in application. But I cannot say the likelihood of what would happen. If you need that one point, then re really what should be happening during your review is that they should be taking into account that you've actually got worse and not better. Now that doesn't always happen in application. The assessments can go wrong and often do, but I would still encourage you to do that. And again, if you wanted to discuss that further with me on better ways in which to um, come forward with what evidence you should be ap applying and um, how you should be um, writing your renewal pack for your review, then you can always come and speak to me at the DLS advice line if you want to call me on 0207 791 I'm on option five. If you leave a message on the answer machine, I will get to you in about five days time and we can have a quick half an hour discussion on troubleshooting ways in which you can, you know, feel more confident in making a, re a review if you need to. But I would encourage you to do it because you should be getting the pit that you deserve. Thank, thank you, Richard. Do you mind just repeating the number very quickly so I can add? Yeah, it? sorry. It's 0207. Yep. 791. Yep. 9800. And it's option five. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Uh, we've had another anonymous question come in, and it says If I'm moving house from a well insulated and adapted house to an uninsulated one, with no underfloor heating or bathroom adaptations. Who do I contact to get help with adapting my next home to my Raynaud's and systemic sclerosis? Yeah, so this isn't actually a welfare benefits question, but I will give you the information as much as I know. So the Disability Law Service, we actually have a care community section who can actually, and a housing section, where the two overlap with each other. So it's actually occupational therapy at your local authority who you should be contacting in regards to adaptations and whether or not the property that you're moving to is actually going to be suitable for you and whether that's the right move to make. So um, if that is the issue that, and, I, and I've got it right, it's really you should be contacting the occupational therapy team at your local authority. But if you need some support or some further information on how to go about doing that, again, call the number 0207 791-9800 and select the option for the housing department and they will be able to give you further advice on how you can go about getting those adaptations or the suitability of your property. Now one other thing I'd like to point out as well, if you are moving to a different locality, this could affect your benefits. So very recently um, the gateway for housing benefit has been closed for uh, claimants who are receiving severe disability premium. What this means is, is that if you're moving to a locality, this will trigger a relevant change of circumstances or natural migration, as we call it, and your housing benefit will stop. So if you are receiving housing benefit, this could potentially be an issue for you because you will not be able to make a new housing benefit claim in the new lo lo locality. You will be forced to move on to universal credit to get help with your, your rent. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for guiding them on uh, where they can get that assistance and providing all of that information. Uh, we've also had a question coming from Diane. Uh, Diane 
says, when you get to pension age, I assume PIP stops. Do you automatically go on to attendance allowance? No, no, you don't. Uh, so if you, if you, when you reach your relevant age, as it says in the legislation, because everybody will reach the state pension age at the moment is uh, 67, but everybody will reach uh, their state pension age at a different time. So we call it the relevant age. When you reach your relevant age, this means that you can, can still continue to receive PIP if you, all, you still have PIP. So as long as you've got a PIP claim when you reach state pension age, you will still be able to continue to receive it. Here's the issue though. If you have a standard rate for your mobility element, you will not be able to enhance it post your relevant age. Now, there are some small circumstances when you can do that. It's complicated, won't be able to go into it today. But again, if you wanted to come and give me a call and discuss that further, and I could also send you through some literature for you to be able to read that as well. But essentially, the, the rules are that you should really be thinking about if you are not on PIP, and, or if you want to enhance your mobility component, you should be doing it before you reach state pension age, because you won't generally be able to do so when you go past your state pension age. But you can continue to receive your PIP. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Um, we've had another question coming. Um, and it's coming from Sharon. And Sharon, Sharon says, when filling in the application for PIP, um, she's not sure what evidence she should be sending in exactly. Mm, that's a good question. All right, so yeah, um, I actually do welfare benefits training. So I actually do training sessions for other charities and volunteers where I give them this information. So I'm gonna give it to you exactly how I give it to them, okay? The best information is GP evidence, okay? And many people will come to me and they will say to me, well, I just don't have medical evidence. How, what can I do? Well, there's one really good way around that, okay? PIP has a window of eligibility. It means that any condition that you are applying and, and showing that you can't undertake activities reliably because of, you have to have, they have to have been present within the last three months and they have to be expected to last for the next nine months. So what I suggest you do is, is call your GP or go in to see them, whichever one is safest for you to do, have a consultation with them once every three months. And then when you have that consultation with them, if your GP accepts that, accepts that this is your difficulties and they discuss any treatment to come with that, that will be added to your GP summary notes. And then in turn, you can apply for that under a subject access request. So you just simply have to go to your GP surgery reception and say, how can I apply for my GP summary notes? And in those summary notes, it will have details of you discussing the difficulties that you're contending with on a daily basis and any treatment that has been put forward for that. And you don't have to bother your GP about that. You just go to the reception to get it. And speaking with your GP once every three months is not going to badger them. That's absolutely reasonable for you to do so. So what you'll start to do there is you'll start to build a paper trail of your medical evidence outside of that of your consultants or specialists or therapists that you're having. Because we're always told by the DWP that GP evidence is the best evidence. But of course, you can also apply evidence from your loved ones as well. So anybody who's involved in your day-to-day -day care, who's observing the difficulties that you're having and giving you any assistance or supervision or prompting to be able to undertake activities, they as well, they can add evidence. They can write short statements to the effect, explaining the level of care they give to you and the difficulties that they observe you having. And that can be powerful. That can be added as evidence. Thank you very much for the very detailed response, Richard. Thank you. Um, we, we've, we've had uh, another very interesting question coming from Sonia. And Sonia asks, what is the best approach to a reassessment form? Should the evidence all be gathered again? Yes, so um, reassessment forms for PIP, uh, work capability assessments, etc. Always, always send your evidence, but never send originals. Always send copies because you'll need those. Um, it's difficult, isn't it, to get your, me your medical evidence. It's difficult to compile it and it's difficult to get it. And the last thing you're going to want 
is to find out that the DWP's lost it or Royal Mail's lost it, and then you've got to build that up again. So when you're filling out a form and you're applying for whether it's work capability assessment or a PIP uh, assessment, make sure that you are supplying medical evidence. Now, um, one piece of information I should give to you is when you're filling out a PIP form, for instance, or a work capability assessment form, have a look at the wording in the section where it says, tell us about your medical professional. It says we may contact them. It doesn't say we will contact them. And that is really interesting, isn't it, to know that, because they, they might not contact your medical professional. So don't rely upon them contacting your medical professional. Send the medical evidence in, send copies of your medical evidence and do it every single time. So also take a photocopy of your application as well so that you can look back at it and you can see. And also if it gets lost, then you've, you've got a copy to spring from straight away. And again, the golden rule when sending any correspondence to the DWP, whether it be an appeal or an application, always send recorded delivery. It's very important. This is the golden rule. A lot of subtle hints there, Richard. So there's a, a lot of attention to detail there when it comes to the reassessment. So thank you for that, Richard. Um, a lot of points to take in. A question is coming from Claire and Claire says, is there a waiting time for PIP from the date of application? So there's no waiting time as such. Um, before the coronavirus, it would usually take around about eight to 12 weeks from application to assessment to payment. Um, obviously, because of the coronavirus, that has gone up you know, quite, quite a lot. Um, so you could be waiting longer than usual for an assessment for a decision. But really, generally, it should be around about between eight to 12 weeks from application to assessment to payment. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, let's have a look at some other questions that have come in. Liz asks, could you please uh, explain reasonable adjustments again? Yeah. Okay, so under section 20 of the Equality Act, um, the DWP employers and their relevant partners, they have a lead, they have a public duty to apply reasonable adjustments that have been asked for if they're reasonable. They must apply them if it will go some way to reducing a disadvantage, a substantial disadvantage. So to give you an idea of what that means, very recently, a member of SRUK came to us and our employment team, and we gave advice. So this particular individual was asking for um, reasonable adjustments in the form that they wanted to work indoors instead of being outdoors. And this would then in turn reduce triggering of their Raynaud's and Escoloderma uh, phenomenon. And so that was more than reasonable to ask for if it could be achieved, because then it would avoid any substantial disadvantage to the employee. And so that's what we're talking about here. If there is any way in which the employer or the DWP can remove obstacles, barriers that will create a substantial disadvantage to you, then they should be applying them. They have a public duty to do so. So don't be afraid to ask for things from the DWP, from your employer, etc., to help you to avoid substantial disadvantage in the workplace or at your assessments. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Richard. We've, we've had another question come in. It's a bit of a complicated one. It says, can I still claim benefits if I have some savings and I live with a partner? I guess it depends on which benefit, of course. Yes, it does. So uh, means tested benefits, universal credit, um, the old legacy benefits, such as a housing benefit, if you're receiving them, um, uh, income support, ESA. So if, you're, if you are receiving those legacy benefits or universal credit, there's a capital limit. And the capital limit is 6,000 to 16,000. So if you've got over you and your partner as well, so this will count your partner, if you have savings, capital or assets that are over 16,000, 
you're actually not entitled to income related benefit. And it's your ongoing duty to report this to the DWP. So um, if you have, um, you and your partner have savings, capitals or assets between six and 16,000, then depending on which benefit you're on, they will apply what's called a tariff income. So if it's the old benefits, such as the legacy benefits, such as housing benefit or ESA, then they will apply one pound, reduce one pound of your benefit every week for every 250 pounds you have in excess of 6,000. So up to the amount of 16,000. So for every 250 pounds you have from 6,000 up to 16,000, they will reduce one pound of your benefit. The universal credit, it's slightly more, it's four pound 35 per week. And that obviously will be translated into your assessment period, which is one month. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'd like to, again, encourage everybody uh, who hasn't so far to please send in a question by hovering over the Q&A section uh, so we can put those questions to Richard. We seem to be doing really well and ahead of schedule in, ter in terms of the presentation and in terms of answering the questions. And we've also had a few thank you messages come in uh, for those questions that you've answered. Thank you. So let's wait Thank a moment or two and see if any other questions come in. Uh, but if not, then um, I guess uh, I'll let you have a few last words, Richard, on any, any additional things you'd like to say in terms of any email addresses, um, guidance in terms of websites and things of that nature. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, I'll take this opportunity to say that um, if any of you are facing a work capability assessment, or a PIP assessment, there are two very great websites that I think you should go and have a look at. For the work capability assessment, it's wcainfo.net. So it's wcainfo.net. And that's for work capability. That's for the work capability assessment, yeah. So this website details the activities, the scoring descriptors, it has links to legislation, it has um, definitions of the terminologies that they use, and it also has case law as well. They discuss the conditions and they discuss, discuss all the issues that are around the work capability assessment. It is very, it's a very good website. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It will go a long way to helping you to understand the assessment that you are going to go under. And also there is a sister website to this, which is for PIP. And it's pipinfo.net. So pipinfo.net. And essentially, it's exactly the same, but it's about PIP. So the work capability assessment is in blue, and the PIP is in purple. And it's set out exactly the same. It's very easy to use, very easy to navigate around and it has all of the scoring descriptors, all of the activities, the case law, links to legislation and terminology. And it is a fantastic website for anybody who's facing PIP to go and have a look at and to be able to familiarize themselves with PIP. So those two particular websites, really great for you to go and have a look at, to be able to arm yourself with some information and to understand the benefit that you're applying for much better. And then other than that, I would just reiterate that if you are having difficulties with your welfare benefits, come and speak to me if you can on 0207 791 9800. I'm on option five. You'll be able to leave me a voice message with your name and your telephone number, and I'll contact you back as soon as I can. It's usually around about uh, four to five days. I'm sure you'll understand it's a very busy time in welfare benefits. And you can also give me um, a an email at benefits at dls.org.uk and again it takes around about four to five days for me to get through to your email but you know please do get in contact with me if you're struggling with your welfare benefits thank you very much richard for all of that amazing guidance you know for for pointing everybody in the right direction i'm sure it's hugely appreciated i'd also like to let everybody that's joined us know that we have a 
a new and improved welfare benefits section on the website. So if you go on to, if you hover over onto the chat section, I've added in, I've added in the link there and it's under our websites underneath find supports. Uh, you can find the new UK welfare benefits section. So please he head over, head over there. Uh, and Richard also, has also contributed to those web pages. Um, so you can find some further guidance there. Uh, we've had a few more questions come in. Uh, one asks, um, would you be able to give some additional information about welfare, welfare benefit changes in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland perhaps? Yeah, so there, there, are, there is going to be a, uh, so PIP is going to be, um, it's going to be um, taken over by a different benefit. I can't remember the name of that off the top of my head right now, but if you go onto the, Sc the Scottish Government welfare benefit pages and you type in uh, to the search bar relevant changes to benefits, you can find all of these relevant changes that are going to be happening in regards to the Scottish child payment into the, uh, the, the replacement of personal independence payment. Also um, in Scotland as well, if you're a carer, if you're getting carers allowance, you can also get a supplementary payment twice a year. I think it's just over 200 pounds, 230 pounds, which is a supplementary payment that goes towards you as well. And um, yeah, so there are some really important changes to Scottish uh, um, benefits, but you can also find these changes on the SRUK up-to-date um, welfare benefits pages now as well on uh, find support. So you can also find links to those particular um, benefits that we that I can't actually remember the names of them so I can't give you the full details but you can, I'm giving you the place where you can actually go and find them so if you can't find them on SRUK just pop onto Google and type in the Scottish Government uh, web page when you get on there if you go into the search bar and you just type in relevant changes to welfare benefits in Scotland it will come up with all of the changes that they're making in Scotland and I have to say Scotland are leading the way in welfare benefits and the um, reintroduction, the, the, the changes that they're making to welfare benefits are most welcome indeed. Richard, thank you again for that amazing answer. Um, we've, we've had another question coming from Joanne. Joanne says, my last PIP assessment said I would not need another assessment until I'm 70. She's confused because she says she's currently 61. Okay, uh, so when you received your personal independence payment decision, telling you how much you were going to receive, what, what award you, you received, it should have told you the fixed term that you received. Now, what that suggests to me is that you've actually been given a 10-year fixed award. So that means that you won't be reassessed by the DWP for your PIP for the next 10 years. Now, obviously, I'm going based on what you've said, so I can't say for sure, but the way in which to figure that out is to either go back to your decision notice, your decision letter that gave you the amount, the award that you were going to receive. It should say on there how long your award is for, the fixed term, as it's called. If you can't find that, then give PIP a call and have them send the letter back through to you so that you can have it there for your own correspondence. But essentially, if what you're saying is correct, if I'm understanding what you're saying, it seems to me as if you've been given a 10 year fixed award. So congratulations on that. That's fantastic. And hopefully you won't have to be reassessed for another 10 years. Now you should understand though, that PIP can reassess you at any time, regardless of how long your award is for. So that's the difference between the old DLA for adults and PIP. There's no indefinite awards anymore. You have to have a fixed term. And that fixed term is generally, most people get between two and three years and it can go anywhere north of that. But you seem to have been given a 10 year award. So congratulations for that. I'm really glad to, to hear that. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, one other question has come in, uh, an anonymous question, and it asks if Blue Badge, uh, okay. the blue badge uh, is this only for mobility? Uh, it's generally based around mobility, yes. So um, there is a automatic application for blue badge and then there's also a uh, further information so the local uh, if you go on to if you go to google and you type in blue badge eligibility it will take you to the gov.uk website where you can actually do an eligibility test there to see if you are eligible based on your circumstances 
but from memory, there is a automatic eligibility criteria, which means if you're getting a certain level of PIP for mobility component, you can get an automatic eligibility for it. But again, just because you don't fit that criteria doesn't mean that you, you're not gonna be able to apply for it. There are circumstances and each local authority has their own guidance on that. So you'll have to go to your local authority webpage on Blue Badge and they can explain to you on their webpage what criteria you can potentially meet to get the Blue Badge. Fantastic, thank you, Richard. And linking onto the Blue Badge, Diane has then asked, if I have a blue badge, should I put this on my PIP reassessment form? Yeah, I think it's a good idea to point it out. It doesn't have any, it doesn't really have any, uh, there's nothing in the PIP uh, regulations or guidance to, because you've got a blue badge <clears throat> that you should get PIP mobility. But it, of course, it's showing that a, of your, your, mainly your blue badge will be based upon your PIP. So really, it's actually that PIP is getting you the blue badge, not blue badge getting you the PIP. So, but of course, you can point it out and you can say that, you know, I should be getting a blue badge because I have mobility issues and that's part of my life and that's part of my condition. So you can mention it, but again, it's the PIP that gets you the blue badge, not the blue badge that gets you the PIP. Thank you very much for that clarity, Richard. Um, Sonia goes on to say, uh, very helpful answers. Uh, oh, thank she, you, thank you, Sonia. She also says that she was previously told that she could apply for a copy of her assessment report. Yeah. But it's not included in the award letter anymore. Is it still possible to apply? Yes, it is. Um, so even if it was previous, and it was for a previous uh, assessment that's gone now, and you want to see it, and you want to read it, and you want to understand it, you can ask for it. You can do a subject access request. And there are um, various different template letters online where people have put together um, template letters. You can have a look at them and see if one, you can edit it to, you know, you can add to it, redact it, whatever you want to do. Or you could just simply just write in and say, I'd like to uh, subject access request on my data and give them the date that you're talking about so that they can give you that information that you're asking for. But yes, they don't give it to you. You have to ask for it. So, but you can get it at any time. Thank you, Richard. Um, so Melanie uh, asks, if you are changing councils when moving home, do you have to renew, replace your blue badge? Um, I would think so, possibly, yeah. I don't actually know the answer to that question because it's never actually come up, but um, I would suspect so, yes, because the rules could be different. The rules are different in certain circumstances from locality to locality. So if it's, for instance, that you didn't get your blue badge under um, the automatic rules, it could be the case. Yes, I don't know positively whether that's the case. I would suspect that you're able to keep it until it runs out and then you would have to apply for it under a new local authority. But again, don't take my word for it because I don't know positively. Call your local authority and find out or call your new local authority and find out and ask them specifically, do I need to register with you for my new blue badge? And that way you're, you know, you're covering yourself and making sure that you're ahead of the game. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we're now into uh, coming, coming up to the end of the session. So if you do have any final questions, please do send those in ASAP and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, for now, we still have a few questions uh, left on our to-do list. And um, one of them uh, says, can you continue to work and claim PIP? I know yeah. I'm unable to work full time due to uh, scleroderma, but still want to try part time. I'm 42 and love my work. Absolutely, of course you can. PIP is non-means tested. It doesn't matter how much you earn or how much savings or capital or assets you or your partner has. It's simply based upon can you undertake the activities under PIP reliably or not? Does it affect you more than 50% of the time? If it does, if your work is not interfering with that, so for instance, it could be you work in IT, so you work on computers. That doesn't mean to say that you don't have difficulty with feeding yourself or you don't have difficulties with washing and bathing, taking your medications, engaging with other people face-to-face, -face, etc. 
standing up and moving around. As long as you're able to get those points and your, your activities under your employment are not contrary to that, then you can get hit, absolutely. And I would encourage you to, to, to do that. If you are working and you're thinking about applying for PIP, go and have a look at the pipinfo.net, rack up the points. If you get eight points for either the daily living component or the mobility component, you'll get the standard rate. You should be getting the standard rate. You'll go for an assessment. And if you get awarded those points, you can get PIP while you're working. It's absolutely fine. If you get 12 points, you'll get the enhanced rate. So, you know, if you're not already on PIP and you're thinking about that and you feel that you meet the criteria, I would absolutely encourage you to go and apply for PIP. At least three billion pounds worth of benefits just goes unclaimed every year. So it's there, you should apply for it. If you need that help, don't be afraid, go for it. And we've got amazing people like Richard who are helping reduce that three billion pounds by giving us that guidance. Um, so jo Joanne follows on from her question about the 10 year reassessment and um, she says, I get mobility from PIP. Uh, my question is, even though I've got a 10 year PIP, my blue badge is renewed every three years. So what information do I need to send in for this if I'm not being assessed? Is it a case of just letting them know that a PIP is set for 10 years? Is that sufficient? Yeah, so again, go on to the, the gov.uk website and have a look at the eligibility. And depending on the uh, which descriptor you've got for the mobility element, whether it's moving around or whether it, it's usually eight points, if I remember from memory, as long as you're getting eight points for either the moving around or the planning and following journeys, which is descriptor E, I believe, I can't remember, I'm just, I'm going from memory, you can check this yourself, guys. But if you meet the automatic eligibility, then all you need to do is to show that that's the case. And to show that that's the case, you send in a letter, your a copy of your PIP award, which shows unequivocally you are getting eight points for moving around or planning following journeys. And that will show the local authority that you, you meet the automatic eligibility. And that's all you need to do. So, you know, you have keep, when you get your award letter or if you, have, you can't find it and you don't know where it is, I would really encourage you to go and get a copy from the DWP sent to you again, and keep it somewhere safe so that you can use it again and again and again to every year apply for your, your blue badge. Thank you, Richard. Um, let's have a look at a few other questions that are just coming in right now. Uh, so I think you've probably already covered this. Uh, in terms of means tested or not being in that list. Uh, so Angela just asks for clarification on if you can get PIP if you are self-employed or thinking of going self-employed. Yes, absolutely. Self-employed, if you're PayYE or you're self-employed, you can still get PIP. But it, it's not, because it's non-means tested, it's not about what you're earning. It's not about how much you, uh, you have in savings or how much property you have assets for, for instance it's about whether you meet the criteria can you do activities reliably or not so the word reliably is really important because it it's actually defined under the the uh, pip regulations 2013 and it means if you can't do an activity safely to an acceptable standard in a reasonable time and repeatedly and that's happening to you more than 50 percent of the time then you should be able to apply for PIP. So if your self-employed work is not contradicting, is not interfering with those activities, then you should be applying for PIP and you shouldn't need to worry about um, your, what you're earning or you know, what assets you have because it won't be taken into account. Thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, so this is the last question that we'll be taking. And it says, my work is now, uh, being affected by my condition and I'll be addressing this with my employer when I return to work following sick leave. Do I need to provide any medical evidence to my employer to support a request for reasonable adjust adjustments? It can be helpful. Yes, absolutely. Now, I'm not an employment lawyer. Um, and if you wanted to discuss that uh, in more detail, 
Um, the Disability Law Service does give advice on employment for disability disabled people and reasonable adjustment. So my colleague Stephen has over 20 years worth of experience in employment and uh, employment law. So if you wanted to discuss that further and get some more help around what, how you should be um, approaching this particular situation, have, come and speak to us on 0207 791 9800. Um, I can't remember what the option is for the employment department, but listen out and leave a message with Stephen and he'll contact you within four, uh, four to five days. And you can have that in a, a more detailed conversation about, you know, how you should approach your employer and what, you know, duties they have in order to look after you. But essentially what it is, is it's section 20. So have a look at section 20. You can use that directly by saying to them, you know, I my work is affecting me and it's affecting my condition. And I was wondering if we could talk about, you know, uh, what reasonable adjustments we could put in place to help me to continue with my work and it will not, and I, we can avoid substantial disadvantage to me because you shouldn't be directly or indirectly discriminated against because of your condition. Your employer should be helping you to remove those barriers, to remove those obstacles, to avoid substantial disadvantage to you. Thank you, Richard. That's uh, hugely appreciated. And um, we're now at the end of the session. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone uh, for the amazing webinar. I'd like to thank our community for making the webinar uh, what it is and for uh, sending in your amazing questions, which have no doubt benefited everyone involved. Um, and I would also, of course, like to thank you yourself, Richard, uh, for your expertise, your time, your efforts, not only with the webinar, but also with the site. It's uh, hugely appreciated by the SRUK family and I'm sure everyone in our community. Um, and, and to our community, I'd also like to say, if you would uh, like to leave some feedback, uh, you can do so by clicking onto the chat function. And uh, we would use this feedback to, of course, improve our webinars further and uh, provide you with the best webinar and the best initiatives moving forward. Of course, we think it's important to, to make sure that we're providing the best information for our community. Uh, and otherwise, just a, another reminder, if you have benefited from this webinar, uh, you can donate five pounds and you can do so by texting SRUK webinar to 70450 and uh, the text will cost five pounds, which will be donated plus your standard rate message. Um, but otherwise, it's been a, an absolute pleasure having you on, Richard, and we've gone through all of the questions, uh, so it's somewhat... Uh, set a new precedent uh, in terms of what of what we've accomplished or been able to accomplish during the webinar um, Excellent. and a lot of questions and a lot of comments have come in have come in thanking yourself so it's been a, you guys. it's been it's thank been you. an absolute pleasure having you on thank you um, but otherwise i'd like to wish everybody a, a lovely rest of the day uh, do take good care and we'll log off now so bye-bye everyone take, take care, care. bye-bye